Do you mind if I drink inside, please? Well, certainly will. Love to do it. We Charlestonians, we like to have a cocktail or ten. Right. Uh, we're all Episcopalians, and in the South we're called whiskey payans. And the reason for that is, the joke in the South is, every time you see an Episcopalian, every time you see four Episcopalians, you're sure to find a fifth. <laughs> and Mr. Bernison Baker right here, uh, of course, he wouldn't know anything about it from first-hand experience, but um, he grew up during the Blind Tiger uh, era. And Berniston, what were you saying earlier about um, back before uh, the Depression, before actually Prohibition? Well, should, right. Certainly Charleston had a number of blind tigers. And in most cases, uh, they were corner grocery stores run by um, newcomers to Charleston, you might say. The immigrants that went into the grocery business had these grocery stores. Um, on these corners, and the working class of people uh, needed a place to drink as well as the upper crust, so to speak. The upper crust went to their private clubs and uh, purchased dr drinks across the bar. Well, the working class needed a place to drink, so these blind tigers were, were basically used by them. And in a lot of instances, they were grocery stores where a, a working class man at the end of a hard day's toil could go into these grocery stores and for 15 cents or a quarter, he would be dispensed a shot of his favorite brown beverage, be it, be it bourbon, scotch, etc. I can't say that I personally saw this being done, but these are the stories that were related to me, David, and um, it goes back, it comes from my father, grandfather, etc., who were all incidentally drinking people. <laughs> well, now, um, what about during Prohibition? How'd that work? During Prohibition, there again, um, whiskey was rather hard to come by. The, the area of Charleston, which I lived with the dowagers and the drinking class of Episcopalians, uh, which I am a member of, um, the, we had bootleggers who had a heyday, but the bootleggers could not be contacted by the downtown Charlestonians, and particularly the dowager women. So they would have a, a compatriot from downtown, uh, a near the well uh, person at times, who would be the contact between the bootlegger and them. They would give the downtown acquaintance of theirs an order for booze, and he would go and deal with the bootleggers and deliver it, if you will, to each of these dowagers' homes. Well, without, without mentioning names, you were talking um, before we started all this, and you were talking about a gentleman, a ne'er-do-well, and there do well, he happened, the one I have in mind happened to be a member of one of our oldest societies, the St. Cecilia. And he came by hard times, so to supplement his meager income, he became a go-between, if you will, between the bootlegger and the consumers from downtown Charleston. Getting a cut. That's certainly making a profit. A finder's fee, as it were. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Well, now, after, um, after Prohibition, of course, it was still illegal. They could buy the drink or still legal. And Charleston being um, had some beautiful um, places for tourists. That was in the days back in the in the twenties and thirties when we, so to speak, had the rich tourists. It was about the time that Gaiman's Hall was starting to be founded. We had the Villa Margarita, the Calhoun Mansion, which catered to the rich, if you will, the rich northern tourists. And we had the DuPonts, the Vanderbilts, who all winted here. They stayed at the Villa Margarita, and the, the Calhoun Mansion took care of the old run, if you will, from the villa. But um, Barbara Hutton stayed here for winter after winter at the villa and took their meals there. Well, that class of person wanted their drinks at night, so the villa, regardless of prohibition, supplied them with their wants. Um, prohibition was tough on us, but again, Charles is a secret seacoast town and we had the navy here and, and we had merchant ships coming in and after a hard two months at sea those fellows when they hit town wanted some pleasure and drinking liquor is a pleasure so they were supplied with whiskey so all do pro doing prohibition um, so to speak the state law enforcement agency sort of took a dim view of Charleston they did not enforce the laws to to the nth degree with us and on into the 30s and the 40s uh, and 50s and 60s, Charleston, contrary to the state law, served liquor by the drink poured out of a, of 
a fifth or fifth fifth in those days. There were no leaders of courts, so they used fifths for pints, half pints, if you, if you will. And there were numerous establishments where you could go in and purchase a drink across the bar, just like you can in any other northern city. And um, what's stopping that? Kind of picks up a little bit. So. Well, Schuyler Parsons was one of these wealthy northerners that would come to Charleston in the winter time to escape the, um, you know, t um, intemperate climate up there. He came to Charleston, he liked what he saw, and he actually ended up sort of going into the antique business here. But he had, in, he had, he had been a host, a famous host, entertaining at his mansion on Long Island, been up and down the eastern seaboard, and he pretty much said that the first time he ever um, encountered cocktail parties was in the city of Charleston in the 1920s and 30s, and he couldn't figure out why. And then he actually started to think about it, and he realized it was actually Charleston's major institution, the three o'clock dinner, that was really responsible for that. Um, Charlestonians historically eating the main meal about three o'clock in the afternoon, um, the heavy meal, and then about five o'clock or so, the Charleston hostesses sending their maids home. So if they wanted to entertain at night, you know, they weren't used to doing dinner parties or anything like that. So with no one there to help them serve or to cook at night, um, these Charleston hostesses, you know, entertaining these people at evening would have their maids or their cooks possibly prepare a ham or something like that, something that they could serve cold, which they could leave out on the tables as sort of a buffet and not actually have a sit-down dinner, and they would serve the alcohol. That would be, so it would be a stand-up affair. People would be coming around having drinks and just having niblets. And going all across the eastern seaboard at this time, Scott or Parson says the cocktail party actually begins in the city of Charleston sometimes in the 1920s. I would also argue that since we invented it, you know, you go to most cocktail parties and they've got those ridiculous plastic plates that you put four shrimp on. No, no, we graze. Uh -huh. oh, yeah. And people say that we're rude, but I would say, no, we started it. People do really complain about um, coming to Charleston cocktail parties and only being napkins there and not having plates. And um, people that have come from other places are kind of appalled by that, but you're absolutely right. People graze at Charleston cocktail parties.